What's going on, everybody? We're going to answer some more questions today. So as always, please leave any questions or comments you might have in the description, and I will get to them as quickly as I can. Let's get to it. What is your preferred? Is it comfort of a guitar or the sound? Well, ideally, in a perfect world, you wouldn't have to make a compromise between the playability of a guitar and how good it sounds. But realistically, sometimes you actually might have to make a little bit of a compromise and kind of choose one or the other. In my own personal experience, I say 100% of the time, go for the playability of the instrument. Because over time, if it feels good to you, you're gonna be more inspired to play it. And usually a good playing instrument won't sound that bad. Now, I actually have had many experiences where the best sounding instrument will be really hard to play. Like for, for instance, uh, the best sounding acoustic guitar I've ever heard I ended up buying was a Guild CV-1. I believe it was called, it was a beautiful guitar and it just had such a great, warm, balanced tone, the best acoustic instrument I've ever, ever heard. But it was such a beast to play. Like the action on it was so bad that like I just had to like just crank the bar chords and like it would really be hard to track a song recording wise and like use bar chords for three consecutive minutes. It was that bad. And I took it to a lot of different guys to try to get the action adjusted. And uh, I, use, I used 12s, uh, 12 gauge strings on an acoustic. And it, nobody could ever get it to play well at 12s. I could have gone down to like 10s and lose a lot of the tension there. But once I went down in string gauge, like it just kind of lost a lot of its body. So it was such a frustrating experience. I found myself not wanting to pick it up or only playing a certain way where I didn't have to use bar chords. But that's just a good example of like the best instrument sound wise might not be the best instrument playability wise. And you always want something that you're gonna wanna play more because the more you play it, the better you're gonna get and the better your, your overall sound is gonna be anyways. What is your favorite guitar that you own? So that leads me to the second part of the story is eventually I just got so frustrated with this guild. I had a project and I had to like record a lot of acoustic guitar for, and I started it and it just was not happening with the guild. So I went to my lo local guitar shop and I traded it in and I ended up getting this Taylor GA3. And at the time I wasn't a huge fan of Taylor's. I was more of a Martin guy. I always thought Taylor's sounded a little too bright and I kind of liked the depth of like a dreadnought guitar. But uh, I was actually kind of wrong about Taylor's in general. I think it was just like, I played the 110s or the 114s or the 210s and 214s, and those are always the bright sound I was used to. And then I got a hold of this GA3. The GA stands for the Grand Auditorium Shape. So it's not as big as maybe like a Martin Dreadnought would be, but the combination of the Sitka Spruce Top and the Sapelli, which is solid wood for the back and sides, gives it like a really beautiful, warm, well-balanced sound that isn't associated with like the, the 114s or the 214s. So I'm super happy that I ended up making this trade because in my experience, even the brighter sounding Taylors that I'm not a huge fan of, they play great. The quality control across the board for Taylor guitars is amazing. Pretty much any one I've ever played comes from the factory set up, ready to play. And it's just a great sounding instrument. I don't feel like I'm compromising the playability for the sound. Again, it might not sound as good as that Guild CV-1, but I think it sounds amazing. And uh, the Taylor GA3, it's definitely my personal favorite guitar. Sadly, they don't make them anymore. Uh, the closest thing you can get is the Taylor 314, which spec-wise, it kinda is about the same thing. Uh, most of them have the Cutaway. It's like a 314 CE is what it's called. For acoustic guitar playing, I don't necessarily need a Cutaway that much. And the other, to some people, it's a downside that it doesn't have electronics in it. This is just a, a regular acoustic guitar. I can't really plug it in. But for my own personal taste, I've never been a huge fan of the way electron onboard electronics sound for acoustic guitars. There's a lot of good ones out there. Uh, the Taylor Expression System is actually pretty good. But I always just think it, I would always, 10 times out of 10, rather mic up an acoustic guitar in a live situation than have to use the, uh, the quarter inch output. Even though a lot of it sounds good, it's always a lot easier just to kind of plug in, but for whatever reason, I'm just not a huge fan of onboard electric systems for acoustic guitars for the most part, with some exceptions. But yeah, Taylor GA3, favorite guitar I own. Which guitar do you recommend, the Squire Vintage Modified Strat or the Vintage V6? Full disclosure, I've never played the Vintage V6. I'd like to get my hands on one, and if any of you have any experience, please uh, put them in the comments so maybe we can get some answers on it. But I do want to say a little bit about the Squire vintage modified guitars and just Squire guitars in general. Uh, I think there's a huge gear snobbery out there. Like 
anything that says Squire as opposed to Fender or Epiphone as opposed to Gibson, a lot of people will just like not even consider just because, you know, they might be made in, in China or somewhere else that, you know, might not have the best quality control. But to me, in my own experience, having played tons and tons of guitars, I used to work at Guitar Center and other shops and stuff like that too. It's all about the quality control. So when you see like a, like a Squire, don't just discount it and dismiss it, play it first. Because the main thing you're paying for when you're paying up to get like an American made instrument or even like, you know, a Japanese made instrument, German made instrument, uh, Mexican made instrument, stuff like that, is the consistency between the models as they call the quality control. So no two guitars are identical, but in a nice factory with a lot of nice regulations and oversight, you get a pretty quality instrument offline no matter what. The thing about the cheaper Chinese instruments, and, uh, and not just Chinese ones, but other ones too, like the quality control between models, there's a huge variance in dynamic. So you might get one Squire that just sounds terrible, it's assembled really poorly, and then you get another Squire that sounds amazing. Like uh, I have one student who has a three quarter size Squire Strat, that's like a $99 guitar you can buy at any store. And I swear to God, like, if you blindfolded me and I could just play it and hear it, I would think I'm playing an American Fender Stevie Ray Vaughan Strat. It sounds that good. So a cheap guitar isn't always a bad guitar. It's just the quality control and the setup and the build quality and stuff like that isn't necessarily as consistent. Now the types of parts are also going to be different. And over time, the electronics might degrade faster, but that doesn't mean for a while you're going to have an incredible guitar, especially if it's just something to learn on or if you like tinkering around with stuff. Uh, you know, you can take more risks with an instrument. So I'm a huge fan of a lot of, of, a lot of the Squire stuff. And in fact, the, uh, the 50s Vibe series, the, the Strats and the Telecasters that Squire did, they have some amazing, amazing guitars that just play great, they sound amazing, they, they stay in tune, and they actually last for a while. So I think the Vibe series, they don't make currently, but you can always find them used. But that's why if you're buying a used guitar is kind of cheaper, you need to play it first. You need to get it in your hands and see how it feels and plug it in and make sure everything works. An American made instrument, you uh, can kind of buy sight unseen and feel a little more confident in it. But really, I think the Squire stuff can be really good. I just can't really say 100% you're gonna get a great guitar, but that's why you always wanna play something like that first. But again, the, the people who kind of like, you know, turn their noses up at Squire, Epiphone, stuff like that, I think it's just, I think it's kind of stupid, really. If you can play it and it sounds great, it doesn't matter what it says on the headstock, it's a good guitar. For listening homework this week, I want you to listen to a band called Little Tybee. They just came out with a new album that you should definitely check out. They have three albums now. They're kind of like folk, psychedelic, progressive rock, I guess if you want to call them. And I think it's a really great example of how two really different guitar playing styles can complement each other really well. They have two main guitarists. Uh, one of them, his name is Brock Scott, and he is an exceptional singer-songwriter, and he has like a really great acoustic kind of feel for composition. And the other guitar player is a guy named Josh Martin, and he plays an eight string, which is kind of beyond me. I can't even wrap my head around playing an eight string for whatever reason. And he is such, he has such an amazing, unique technique to his playing that you should really check out. And I think really, it's a great thing to listen to because you can see how two guys with very different styles meld together and create kind of like a cool mixture. And also with Josh, the eight string player especially, I think it's a good example of how to play really busy but still play in the pocket. I think there's a tendency for guitar players in general to, once they get to a certain point uh, of skill, they kind of want to use that skill and showcase it all the time, like always going 100 miles an hour. And this guy can do a lot of pretty incredible thing. He does a lot of tapping and arpeggio stuff. And I think it's a good example of, especially the way they mix it too, how a really busy player can still sound really good in the pocket, in the construct of a band, without having it be the showcase of a whole thing where it's kind of all over the place and it's kind of hard to really lock into as a listener. So definitely check out Little Tybee's new album. I'll hit you with a couple links to some music videos on their YouTube channel. They got a lot of cool creative videos too. You might want to check out. But also be sure any comments or questions, hit me up in the comments, and I will talk to you next time. Thanks.